God could have chosen anywhere on earth, but he chose Israel. He could have revealed his redemption anywhere. He chose Jerusalem. The house of the Lord might have been any place on earth. He chose Mount Moriah. Past, present, and future, the mountain of the Lord has been a beacon of hope and remains a strategic site for the next temple of God. Dateline Jerusalem, the coming temple. We are so glad you've joined us today. We are halfway through our series, Dateline Jerusalem. Guys, glad to have you here today. What's going on today? This is the episode I think everybody has been waiting for. All those, you know, red cow junkies and third <laughs> temple shippers. We're talking about the third temple. It's coming and there's details surrounding it. It's not the joyous, happy occasion oh. everybody thinks it is. It's kind of foreboding, doomed to come. But hey, that's what's going to bring people to see it, right? You know? You seem way too excited about the foreboding <laughs> nature of this. <laughs> Abominations, you know, things happen. Right. Ugh. Heavy mm. stuff. We're glad that you guys are in these seats. We're also <laughs> glad that Dr. Jeffrey Seif is in Jerusalem, right? Right. We take you right there where he is on location. Let's go there now. I'm coming to you from just off the beaten path in the Jewish quarter in the city of Jerusalem. I'm standing in front of an institute. Many people are walking by. They don't really know what it is, but some people do. And it is special with a capital S. The Temple Institute is funded uh, by religious Jews principally, but not exclusively, uh, by evangelicals too, who are supportive of their bid to rebuild the temple complex in Jerusalem. Jewish people see this as a necessary ingredient to restore Hebrew worship, and it participates in their mind's eye uh, with the Messianic era that dawns. Uh, Christian people see the uh, remanufacture of the temple as having, as having eschatological significance, that it's significant uh, for uh, the coming of the Lord for reasons that are unpacked in our program. But here I am coming to you from the place. Actually, this story began when they came to us, to Texas. And the reason is because uh, the Temple Institute folk had learned that in Texas, uh, there were red heifers without spot or blemish, and they need it for the manufacture of the purification elements for the third temple. It just has to be. And according to uh, Maimonides, who is the principal Jewish sage of antiquity, the next uh, red heifer uh, will be the one that comes in advance of the Messianic era. So this, this excitement, uh, there's a kind of Messianic fervor associated with it. And there's this rebuilding the furnishings. Inside this building, they've already built uh, the incense altar for use in the temple, the table of showbread, uh, the, the menorah, the candelabra, is uh, on display. They built it. You can see behind me on the sign, this is the Aaron Kodesh, the Ark of the Covenant. The belief is, is that's going to be found uh, before the dawn of the Messianic era, that it was spirited away in the days of Jeremiah before the destruction of the temple. But the point is, we're, we're at a place uh, where individuals are laboring to participate in the coming of the Lord and the rebuilding of the temple. And this is a story we're so pleased to bring to you as we look at Dateline, Jerusalem. In addition to the many temple vessels and artifacts inside the Temple Institute, there's another very important one, strategically placed outside, nearby, in the heart of the Jewish quarter. It's an enduring symbol and it's a popular attraction. I mention that because round about me are many people looking to get a shot of this menorah, this candelabra that sits proudly in a square in the Jewish quarter of the city of Jerusalem. It was manufactured by uh, religious Jews from the Temple Institute who are uh, retooling uh, furnishings for the temple according to the specifications of Judaism's rabbis. And so the menorah, the candelabra, you may well be familiar with it. It's one of the central articles in the holy place. You go back to the book Shemot, Exodus, there in uh, 
Moshe Rabbeinu Moses is commanded to tool uh, a, a candelabra and the light was to burn in perpetuity. Of course, the light was snuffed out historically. Uh, one of the more famous depictions using the menorah is that after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, when the Romans uh, returned to the capital city with their spoils, there's what's called the Arch of Triumph there right outside of the Colosseum. It still stands. And it's a picture of the menorah that stood in the Beit HaMikdash, that stood in the temple being taken off. And there's a sense in which uh, with the taking off taking away of the, the, the candelabra, the menorah, it's like taking away the light, the life of the people of Israel. Well, it's all coming back to life now, isn't it? Not only is the city surrounded uh, roundabout by visitors, Jews and Christians alike here, we're in the Jewish quarter, there's a famous synagogue behind me, and in front of it is this uh, piece of sacred paraphernalia that is built in anticipation of its being reemployed in a rebuilt temple, if you can imagine that. It's a fascinating story. You know, the, in the Newer Testament, uh, the, the story is picked up on, but it's personalized. Actually, the personalizing of the light itself goes back to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 21, where David is referred to as the lamp of Israel. David, his enthusiasm, his verve is, is what gave vision for the future. Jesus picks up on that theme. You might recall in the Johannine Gospel, uh, the eighth chapter, Jesus, Yeshua said, I am the light of the world, and those who follow me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Well, the theme of choshech, darkness, and or light, goes back to early Genesis, dispelling the darkness, uh, bringing forth new light. It's a symbol uh, in the uh, Jewish world for what comes forth from the Jewish world, that is Jewish literature, biblical literature. And in biblical literature, we hear the story of the tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, the story of the menorah is central. And it's become a, a symbol of Israel. You can find various kinds of insignia with the menorah. Uh, you know, their flags fly with it, etc. In fact, there was discussion about the uh, menorah itself being, if I recall correctly, part of the, the, the flag of the nation state of Israel. Instead, uh, the nation opted for a star, the Mogan David, the Star of David. But here I want you to see this because you're looking at one of the more uh, popular pieces of, uh, of furniture that's been recreated according to the specifications per the understanding of the way Jews uh, reckoned the various temple accoutrements were designed in Jesus' day. And it's an exact replica of it to those very, very specifications. And it wasn't built for tourists. It's now drawing tourists. It was built for use in a rebuilt temple. Now this series, Dateline Jerusalem, takes a look at the book. We look at the Bible on one hand, we look at what's happening in Israel today. We consider what's happening on the Temple Mount, we consider what's happening around it. And it's all about getting you in touch with prophecy that is being fulfilled in our day. In Matthew 24, we read about the Lord's reference to the Temple while He's on the Temple Mount. And then, we're told, he sits down upon the adjacent Mount of Olives with his disciples. In a quandary about the signs of his return, the disciples ask the Lord about the end times. 2,000 years later, questions are still being asked upon the Mount of Olives regarding the end times and about preparations being made for the next temple. Yitzhak Bamo speaks further about the menorah and the subject of the red heifer. Menorah, everybody know, everybody want to see it. It was easy to put it outside, to put a glass you don't have to explain what is exactly, how it's done. It's simple. And I think that there is a secret answer. The menorah is the symbol of the temple. Even in Rome, when you're going under the ark, you can see everybody talk about the menorah. And why that? Because the menorah is a light. The menorah, as you know, we, have, we celebrate Hanukkah every year. And actually, we have all the temple was destroyed and built again, and the Maccabees and the, the Greek, and everything is fine. At the end of the day, how we mention the temple in Hanukkah? By Hanukkah. Hanukkah is like the menorah. Because the menorah is the power of light. And maybe, maybe this is the reason that the menorah going outside by God. 
When I was a kid, we just read about the temple. Today, my grandson, he bring me a book with a picture of the temple and ask me, what is this, what is this? I think that the way that the Temple Institute started to publish book with the pictures and to make it reality, more people can talk about it. I can give you a good uh, example, the red heifer. I think that five years ago, nobody even thought about it. And today, thank God, in, in less than a year, I, millions of people connect us and, and want to know about the red heifer. When you do something, when you talk about something, when you research about something, at the beginning you are like uh, crazy. Let's take time and then people connect you. Dr. Seif was teaching at the Golden Menorah. And it's a place that we take you on tour. We've been there many times. It's very impressive. Mm -hmm. And to think that that's part of what's coming in the third temple, yes? That's right. And that's the actual one. It's sitting there. We yes. can see, we, we think little menorah is ginormous. And they plan on putting that in the third temple. And the interesting thing about that, as Jeff has taught many times, is that represents the tree of life. You see the branches, you know, the seven branches of menorah. And all of the temple itself was supposed to be that mirror of Eden. With, you know, engraved on the golden walls are palm trees. You see the pomegranates. The Holy of Holies being the garden that's guarded by the Herovim that's engraved into that veil. It was supposed to remind man that they could return to Eden one day, even though they were cast out during the interim. What was so interesting to me was that this third temple that we're talking about, it's not even going to house the Shekinah, the, the, manifest, the manifest presence, presence of yeah. God. But yet Satan is such a jerk that he's decided that he's going to go ahead and desecrate it anyway. It's true. We, we read in 2 Thessalonians 2.4 that he is going to abominate that temple. He's going to set up this idol to himself, the image of a beast, and he's going to sit down upon the Kes Harachamim, the mercy seat, and declare himself to be God, which means that the Ark of the Covenant most likely will return in that third temple. Wow. But it's very interesting, and many people uh, ask me why I believe that the third temple will not begin construction until the peace treaty is aligned with the beast in Israel. It's because of Daniel 8.14, we get a very specific timeline given, and it's of the beginning of daily sacrifices to the ceasing of this abomination when it's finally restored. Uh, which we know is the second coming of Yeshua. 2,300 days, it says. Well, you look at the seven-year tribulation, 360 days of a Jewish year, that's 25, 20 days. Subtract that 2,300 days. We're doing a lot of math here, Einstein stuff. <laughs> you get day 220 is the day that sacrifices begin, the actual inauguration of a third temple, which tells you that it's less than a year that it's going to take for them to build the temple, wow. which is the exact timeline that some of these rabbis are giving us. They say a year to build that temple. Y'all had no idea that prophecy required mm. a calculator. Yeah. But Caleb has <laughs> proved math that too. it's very important. But when you spell it out for me, I can, I can follow that. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. But again, you see, because this is such a, uh, important thing in the enemy's plans to cause this problem. Yeah. He goes to such great lengths to desecrate this. It's so important that we know his schemes and that we don't fall for his plans by knowing what God's plans are. Yeah. Totally. That's good. Right now we take you to the Southern Steps with Dr. Seif's teaching. Let's go there right now. Jesus spoke about the stones crying out, and he surely was right. These stones are talking. They're telling us by the border here that these stones come uh, by way of King Herod from that era. So this is actual, the, actually the rocks, the stones that were here in the temple in Jesus' day, the Herodian temple, so-called. And not only are you here at the southern wall, uh, but we'll get to the entrance in a second. People are more familiar with the western wall of the Jerusalem temple where people deposit prayer requests. But there's prayer requests deposited here because it's sacred to Jewish people. But the spot is sacred to uh, people that are interested in Jesus' story because he would have gone through these very gates. You can see these arches above me, the hold the gates from Jesus' day. He would have walked right through here. Jesus walked this way He's not the only personality with an interest in making his way through these gates. I mention that because the Apostle Paul, in his Thessalonican correspondence, gives voice to the fact that one day, future from his own day, the devil himself will enter these sacred environs and defile them. 
This will come in advance of the second coming of Christ. It's part of what we call the eschaton, last day's events. Rabbi Paul was very clear that the temple factors into the last days because in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's explicit. He says that the rebellion, that is the ultimate uh, you know, war against things divine, comes first when the lawless man is revealed, the one destined to be destroyed. And it's in verse 4 where we have the temple reference. It says he opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in the temple of God and proclaims himself that he is God. And thus I say that according to this author, at some point out in time, there's going to be a reconstituted temple within which the devil himself will walk, referred to on a few occasions in the Thess Thessalonican correspondence as the man of lawlessness. And it's mindful of the fact that there is going to be a temple complex at the ragged edge of time. Those who take the Bible literally and seriously see that because in order for this to happen, what Paul describes, there has to be a temple for it to happen in. When Jews look at biblical literature, they envision a reconstituted temple, a reconstructed temple. And we're here in Israel exploring how amongst the religious Jews, there's a revival of interest. And there's this gathering together of accoutrements necessary in order to dedicate the space, space that will be dedicated here at this site at some point in the future. On previous programs, we've considered how the tabernacle is a picture and pattern of worship in temples past and in the coming temple. We've seen how the altar of burnt offerings, the menorah, and the altar of incense will all have a place in the temple, and more importantly, picture the plan of salvation through Yeshua. Ariel Sims is an Israeli believer in Yeshua and a guide for the tabernacle facsimile located in southern Israel. We asked him when he thought the third temple would be built. I know that the Bible talks about a third temple being built. It will be built, but it's not necessarily going to be a good thing. Um, we know that, that the temple will be built, but the Israelis think a lot about, you know, that be, when the third temple is built, then the Messiah will come, which they're kind of partially correct. When the, when the temple is built, a Messiah will come, but not the Messiah, not Yeshua the Messiah. It will bring the Antichrist, and he's going to come and defile the temple. So it's not going to be necessarily a good thing, unfortunately. But it is going to be a, a step closer to, to those end times. And when Yeshua returns and he reigns for a thousand years, he's going to reign from the third temple and that will be his, his throne. Yeah, it's still a little bit of time before that happens, before until it actually comes. But um, we don't know exactly when it's going to happen. Yeshua specifically says in Matthew 24, no one knows when is it going to happen. But but we can see the signs that, that are that that is coming closer yeshua says you can look at the at the almond flower and know like you know the when the almond flower blossoms that's when you know that spring is near spring is coming but spring is not quite there yet so he compares that to let's say the end times he gives us signs of of wars and and rumors of wars and and disasters natural disasters and all sorts of things that that are happening that will happen before the end times come and we see that happening today, all around us, all around the world. Tragic, devastating events that I would say are, are the almond flowers showing us that the end times are, are coming close. We see uh, the war in Ukraine right now. We see, we see uh, Afghanistan. We see, we see the, the recent uh, uh, earthquakes in, in Turkey and, and, and Syria. And, and it's just, it's, it's sad to see. But Yeshua warned us that it's going to happen, and, and this is what's coming up. Also, it also, the Bible also talks about the entire world turning against Israel eventually, and we also see that. I mean, obviously, there have always been some people, uh, many nations that, that have risen up against Israel, especially our immediate neighbors uh, that border us. But we see it more and more increasingly around the world. More and more, uh, more and more, uh, let's say, Europeans are turning against Israel. Unfortunately, no one is not many people are talking about anti-Semitism um, uh, coming back in Europe and even in America. 
no one, the media is not talking at all about anti-Semitism in America, even though we have obviously a, an official uh, peace treaty with, with America, I would say America's our um, international uh, relations like, best friend, but, but eventually America is gonna turn against us as well, which will be a very sad day. I wanna make something very clear. The spirit of anti-Semitism is truly the spirit of Tsar Hamashiach, Antichrist. Satan is always trying to stick it to God by annihilating his chosen people. That's the only way he can get to God's heart. And although many people have seen this third temple as a great opportunity to support Israel, uh, to support these, these sacrifices, I've always seen it for what it is, a impending sign of the doom to come where Satan will utilize that to instigate the time of Jacob's trouble in which he will annihilate the Jewish people. I had the opportunity to sit down with Mark Hitchcock and ask him when these things might come to pass. We're back again with Mark Hitchcock. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Glad to be with you. There's a lot of talk today amongst believers, amongst Jews, about rebuilding the temple. Mm. Uh, a lot of interest going on. Some people think there's not going to be another temple. Some people think the next temple is Messiah's temple. When are we going to see this new temple show up? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly when it'll show up, but mm. we do know it has to be in place before the middle of the tribulation period. That's right. Yeah. Because at the middle of the tribulation period in, in, in Daniel 9:27, it says that the sacrifices are going to be ended. Mm. Well, for them to be ended, they have to be happening. Yeah, they have to begin. For... So they have to have been going on for some period of time. Now, we don't know how long before that they've been going on. Hmm. So the, the third Jewish temple could be built there on the Temple Mount, that 36-acre Temple Mount, could be built before the rapture takes place. Hmm. It doesn't have to be, but it could be. Interesting. Um, it can also be built after the rapture takes place. There's going to probably be a gap of time between the rapture and the beginning yes, of the tribulation. Is. That's right. So it can be built in. And people don't realize, too, the, the, the temple is not a big building. It's 2,700 square feet yeah. inside. So it's not some you know, huge structure to be built in. It doesn't have to be built with all the opulence and extravagance of Solomon's temple. It can just be a very simple structure. Now, part of the big problem is that the, the Dome of the Rock is there. Yeah, squat And the Al-Aqsa Mosque. <laughs> and so, yeah, what, what's going to happen? And a lot of people say, well, how could they ever build a temple there? Well, you know, 100 years ago, people said, how can the Jews ever come back to their land? That's right. But they're there today because of God's, God's sovereignty, His yes. will. And people say, how can there ever be a temple there on the Temple Mount? Well, God will bring it to pass. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, but He'll bring it to pass in His time. And we know it'll have to be sometime during that first part of the tribulation, first half mm -hmm. of the tribulation period. And a lot of uh, movement is afoot in Israel today uh, to, to bring that to pass. So, you know, if, if it happens before the rapture, I always tell people, you know, lift up your heads. That's right. Uh, your redemption drawing near. Check your watches, guys. That's Get right, ready. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mark. That's great insight. Thank you. Mark Hitchcock has provided a wealth of information concerning prophecy. And if you need more of that information, we have his book, The End. It's a concise encyclopedia of all things prophetic, written in a manner that you can simply understand. We're giving this to you as a gift when you give us an offering. And also this bookmark, which has a prophetic scriptures that Josh and I picked out, it'll be an encouragement to you as well. We hope that you find great value in this whole series. And in our program, Our Jewish Roots, we go to all ends to bring you the best of the best who are speaking prophetic words over this world. And Mark Hitchcock is one of the best out there. And we just hope that you know that you are keeping this program alive. You're keeping it going out to the complete world and the prophecies and the wisdom that we bring to you is only because of your donations. So uh, in Hebrew, toda raba, thank you so, so much for keeping the word going out to the world. Also, I had a thought, an aha moment a while back, actually Sunday night, Kirsten and I had a concert, and as we were getting ready to sing, we watched this lady run up to the platform, and she said, I am so excited, I am all caught up on our Jewish roots. And I thought, what a great story that she told us that. So if you're maybe wanting to catch up on some of our past programs, it's very easy to do. You go to levitt.com, Bearded Bible Brothers, you can find them on there, our programs from the past. Uh, yeah, on our website, but also yeah. on social media, whatever right. social media platform you are on, 
Joshua and Caleb have other secret identities. They're known as the Bearded Bible Brothers. Right. And they have pretty much a weekly program. Get caught up on those also so you'll kind of know who they are and know their heart. And you are sitting in big seats right now and you're bringing forth your own prophetic words about what's coming up. And we appreciate mm. that. Well, this whole episode has been about kind of the abomination this desire of Satan ever since Isaiah 14, ever since he was cast out of heaven, to place his throne above El Elyon, the Most High God. And as Yeshua warned in Matthew 24, 15, it hasn't happened yet, this abomination. Even though Antiochus Epiphanes IV was an elaborate dress rehearsal, Daniel 9, 27 is still to be fulfilled. We can get caught up in the idea that because it's prophetic, that means there's nothing we can do to change uh, the outcome. For instance, what's gonna happen here uh, in the tribulation, the Bible says is going to claim two thirds of the lives of the remaining Jewish people. Mm. We don't want that to be a big number. You say two thirds, we can't change that. That's in the word. But two thirds of eight million versus two thirds of a smaller number is a completely different story. How do we get that number down? We get that number down by sharing the good news of Yeshua with the Jewish people. You have an opportunity if you know him personally to share him with others, and that's your responsibility. If you're watching today and you've been raised to believe the Messiah hasn't come, I am here with the great news of telling you he has come. Yeshua came and died for you. He rose again on the third day. He sits by the Father, and he's preparing a place for you. And today is the day you make the choice to commit your life to him for an eternity because he's committed his to you. I think that's a great idea because, honestly, before you just said that, I've never thought about that because I think we kind of figure, okay, how many people are in Israel right now? How many millions? Ooh, two thirds of that. But what a great incentive that we know that in, yeah. we know that number, yeah. right? Or the percentage, yeah. but we have power over yes, that we darkness. Amen. We can overcome mm. that number. Yep. Oh, no, that's good. I that's feel good. like I've been in Sunday school today, guys. <laughs> Thank you for your insight. I can't mm. believe it's time to go. Mm. As we always say, Sha'alu, Shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our resource this week, The End, written by Mark Hitchcock. This 500-page hardcover book is made available to you for your generous donation to Zola Levitt Ministries. The accompanying bookmark by Joshua and Caleb provides important scripture from God's Word concerning the end. Please remember, we depend on your generous gifts, which allow us to bring timely updates regarding Bible prophecy and the end of days. Thank you so much for your continuous support of this ministry. Visit our website, levitt.com, for tour information, broadcast schedule, free monthly newsletter, and online store. Join us right now on our social media sites for exclusive content. Call us anytime at 1-800-WONDERS and ask about this week's resource. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.